everyone. Uh, it's very nice of you all to come inside on such a gorgeous day. Uh, and we're going to hear some fabulous music afterwards. So I was asked to uh, select a work from our collection based on the theme of the city. And actually I chose a work when Melbourne was just becoming a city. Uh, this is a work by the artist Henry Byrne, painted in 1861. So at the time, Melbourne was, uh, I think it's 16, uh, 26 years old at the time. I certainly grew up never knowing anything about the history of Melbourne, which I've lived in most of my life. Uh, but Melbourne was founded in 1835, quite a long time after Sydney. There's a very distinct, uh, different history. And Melbourne was very much a Victorian city, uh, established in 1835, actually by Tasmanian settlers who were frustrated by the fact that there was all sorts of land they knew of uh, across Bass Strait. But the, uh, the government, uh, which then resided in Sydney, uh, was not allowing expansion uh, across uh, into what we now know as Victoria. But until 1851, uh, Melbourne was part of New South Wales. It was ruled through the governor in Sydney uh, and then with a lieutenant governor, La Trobe, uh, who uh, 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 ruled in his stead here. But 1851, Victoria was founded, separated from uh, Sydney, from uh, New South Wales, and was named, the state was named Victoria. Uh, Victoria had come to the throne in 1837. Uh, so just a few years earlier. Was there, is there paintings of uh, Tasmania, Hobart, before there were ever street scenes like this in Melbourne painted? We do, do have know? some paintings of Tasmania, which are in the next room just here, but I'm not sure of the date of them. They're probably sure. around this same period. Yeah. But Tasmania was founded in 1802, after they tried to actually set up a settlement here in, uh, in Sorrento, in fact. Uh, for six months, a settlement was founded, including convicts uh, at Sorrento, but they didn't really find the fresh water of the Yarra. Uh, and so they abandoned that settlement in 1802 and uh, went down and founded Hobart. Uh, so we've got this very interesting history as well. But 1851 is very important. Not only did Melbourne separ uh, Victoria become a separate colony, uh, but it was the same year that gold was discovered. So not only was it uh, separate, but it had money. And with money, it had people. Yeah. By 1858, there was something like 200,000 people on the gold fields. And so Melbourne had actually been settled by, uh, very much by people wanting to establish land, uh, establish a very Victorian uh, colony, and there was utter social turmoil. The ships, the ports were clogged with ships that couldn't sail away because all the crew had abandoned them to go to the gold fields. Uh, people woke up finding that their servants had abandoned them for the gold fields. And then, if they were very unlucky, well, if the servants were lucky, they came back wealthier than the people they previously worked for. But very few, of course, actually made it really wealthy. So that's just something about the people at the time. So it, wasn't, it wasn't like just miners or people who were into that world were out there doing the mining. It's like people like myself or anyone, anyone might just go, anyone. my God, I'm just going to head out to Ballarat it's and see what happens. Just think, if, if you knew that there were tats tickets out there on the ground that you could pick up and some of them would be winners, everybody went. Yeah. And one of the things for Melbourne is that a lot of artists came hoping to make it wealthy. Behind you, you see a lot of Von Gerard paintings. Von Gerard came out for the gold fields. Nicolas Chevalier came out for the gold fields. People associated with the pre-Raphaelite movement in England came out for the gold yeah. fields. And Henry Byrne came out in 1853 for that very reason as well. Most of them ended up turning back to their art, which absolutely was beneficial to um, the artistic community of 19th century Melbourne. We talked privately about people, the first artists painting landscapes, and they were trying to show Mother England and, uh, you know, the people back home, mm. home at the time, yep. uh, of, you know, the progress being made and maybe making a romanticised view of what Australia was. Often there's a street scene with, like, a token corroboree yes. looking very peaceful yes. in, in the sidelines. Yes. So for Henry, do you think at, at this point, was there still some of that going on? Do you think he was trying to paint... Uh, a realistic portrait of Swanston Street at the time, or was he trying to show some kind of romantic view of what was going on? I think you can probably see from this that he's actually doing both. If you actually want to come up and look later, you can actually see his pencil lines. He was very much uh, an accurate architectural and topographic draftsman. So he's drawn things in very carefully, but at the same time, Melbourne was unlikely to be as clean and pristine as this. This looks extremely middle class. 
uh, you're not seeing dirt or mess or... Uh, and I was curious, yeah. where are we now? Because this okay. is, so if, if we're looking at... Are we around about here where this guy yeah. is playing with his yeah. dog? Can you recognise the scene? We're looking north. So if you have NGV International over here, Federation Square is here, we're looking up Swanston Street. But that's not the church that I know. The only thing that actually still stands from all of the um, images, that you, all the buildings that you see here, <laughs> is Young and Jackson. <laughs> and even that, I went and looked very hard. Um, the three-storey building, you can you can see that it's the same building, but it's been highly modified. And in fact, it's very difficult to see now because all the tram stop, uh, the shelters from the tram stop is in the way. But this is where the um, Flinders Street Dome is now. Sorry. Uh, and this is where Federation Square starts. But things like the, the church, you can see the church is the wrong way round. This was a church that was built, the first St Paul's was built in the 1850s. They knocked it down in the 1880s because they could do better. They had all the money from the gold fields and they wanted Melbourne to be, you know, equivalent to any other colonial city around the world. So it was knocked down and rebuilt uh, at 90 degrees. Um, you might be able to, for those of you who have been a very pernickety and come and look up later, this, the building beside it there looks very like the chapter house that still exists next to St Paul's, but it's not. That was built in 1890, I checked. Um, but the other thing, that not even is the bridge the same. The first bridge across, um, across the Yarra was built in 1845. It was built out of wood. In 1850, uh, the first stone bridge was built, and that was opened, formally opened, at the celebrations of, woohoo, we're Victoria. Big celebrations. There's a print that shows everybody having a great old time there. And then this, uh, so that's the bridge that we're he seeing here. The bridge that we know today was built in 1888. But you can see, if you come and have a look later at the various people that they're showing, we've got the military being shown, we've got a very elegant family here. But one of the things I find interesting, if you look particularly at the horse's legs, they're blurred. And I think he was influenced by photography, which was invented in the 1830s and came out to Australia very quickly. Um, people in Australia caught on to technological um, ideas very quickly. But I think it was looking at the way um, photographs, of course, had to, didn't have very quick exposure at the time, but I think that's why he's trying to evoke the sense of movement with the blur of the horse's legs there. Was there a lot of the documenting of history at the time based in Melbourne? We're talking about the gold fields. I, I read in a few books occasionally that for a moment in perhaps Ballarat, it was a bigger metropolis than Melbourne for a little while. So is there is there the same documentation, is there the same paintings of the goldfields at the time or was everyone just out there working or was it? Uh, a, bit of, a bit of both. Melbourne was absolutely the hub. You know, it was a town, rapidly became a city. It was where the treasury um, uh, was based, uh, it was where the government was based and it was where the port was, of course. So everything came through Melbourne. But Ballarat, Bendigo, Castlemaine were the key hubs of Victorian, the Victorian goldfields. And for that very reason, we're really lucky in, in Victoria to have such fabulous regional galleries there. They've all got great buildings. Uh, they've all got extraordinary collections. Some of the other states are not nearly as fortunate as we are in not only do we have this wonderful uh, state collection here, but that we have the regional collections as well. And, and images of um, all of these, uh, you know, images of the goldfields, images of developing Victoria, um, are all distributed uh, through those various and institutions. Obviously the, the governance of Australian people at the time in the East Coast was coming from New South Wales. When it, Victoria was handed over... 51. In 51. So is that pre-gold rush? Because I kind of like the idea yeah. that yeah. they handed over they're governing to Victoria and then all yeah. of a sudden gold is struck yeah, yeah. and so the people ruling Victoria, or mm. the Europeans doing mm. it, suddenly have this world of money and activity Absolutely. and so it yeah. must have grown very quickly. It, it just boomed, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. it certainly was a gold rush boom. People were coming from America, of course people were coming from China, people were coming from all around the, um, you know, throughout the United Kingdom. People just came, anybody who could come here could, a lot left. But a lot of people also then, if you didn't make the money on the gold fields, you'd turn to other things. You might set up as a shopkeeper or you might work out that you could raise m better money providing for diggers rather than actually being a digger yourself. Yeah. One of the things about 
um, all this social turmoil is that the people who had established it, such as Redmond Barry, for example, um, notorious as the person who sentenced Ned Kelly, but he did amazing things in, in helping to set up the library, the gallery, the university, people in that sort of upper, upper educated classes who came out to Australia wanted to try and set up a good, strong, socially cohesive community. Uh, and so this, this painting, painted in 1861, this is painted the same year that the NGV was founded which is extraordinary, you know, we're very lucky. That, and, and the NGV was one of the earliest public galleries in, in the world. Yeah, it's a know, good point Australia. because most, ev most of the artists that we've discussed after this period have mm. all studied at the NGV school. Yep. So the NGV yep. played this role where, mm. I'm, I, I'm still trying to figure it out, they've just held night classes or day classes and both. Uh, and, both. and mm. so a lot of the people we've discussed over the whole season were part, through the NGV yep. crowd, and learn their trade within yeah. this kind of realm yeah. as well. And the people who first came, of course, had artistic training overseas. Von Gerard in Germany, uh, Henry Byrne, who grew up in Birmingham, came out. So people came with their training, which of course influenced what was taught here. Uh, and yeah. then slowly they started to be Australian-born artists, who of course then wanted to go back overseas to see the art that was over there. I was going to ask you, because the, the art movements, as early as you go back, were kind of slower moving through the Renaissance, through this period, like a, what, what, someone like Henry Byrne, yeah. who would they, him and his friends who were painting pictures like this mm. at the time, who would they have been talking about that they might have been looking up to or imitating? Who was Henry Byrne's peer, like, in, at the time, in, in Europe? Because like, what was going on at the time that he would have gone, this is how I'm going to paint? Probably it was very traditional. Yeah. I don't think he would have been involved in... I mean, he, he's very much a provincial artist, whether he was working in Birmingham or working in Melbourne. Um, he was very much a provincial artist wanting to document um, the scenery around him and, and basically make art that was saleable. He's also known for producing lithographs, so prints that were, um, could be sold much more easily and more affordably than, than the paintings. Um, Without photography, printmaking was the way that, uh, that art could be disseminated. Uh, so there would have been sort of newspapers with wood engravings in them, for example, <laughs> that showed art that was overseas. But a lot of people in Australia bought art as well. And the local artists actually were frustrated by the fact that a lot of the people here who had money to buy art didn't want to buy local art. They wanted to import um, copies of Renaissance paintings. Uh, and copies of English paintings. The standard of art coming out here wasn't particularly good, whereas the standard of art that was being produced here is now what, of course, we, we highly value. And on the subject of Henry, do you know much about him? So was he a Melbourne city boy? Was he raised, uh, or was he, he did was he come he, from overseas? Yeah, what, yeah. what was he doing and was he, did he spend time, what suburbs was he in, what was he doing at yeah. the time? There's not a huge amount about him. Uh, but he was born around 1807 in Birmingham. Certainly had some training, but not a huge amount that we're aware of. Uh, there was a person in the 1970s who did a fair bit of research about him, and if you want to Google La Trobe Journal Henry Byrne, you can read that. Uh, but he came out to Australia almost certainly for the gold in 1853. And another family who came out in the same boat as he, uh, one of the daughters of that family he later married. Didn't have any children. I think he was 42 when he came out here. So it wasn't just the young people who were dashing out to make their fortunes. It might have actually been that he knew he wasn't going to really become a hugely successful artist in England, whereas he might have seen that he thought that he might have had further opportunities here, for example. He exhibited at some of the early art associations here. He certainly exhibited with some of these other artists whose names we now know better. Um, but he certainly didn't, didn't make it big. And in fact, he ended up uh, dying in some poverty at, in, in what was known as a benevolent asylum. Does he have a large body of work? There's only a small body of work. Uh, there's a, a small number of paintings up in um, the State Library. And again, this, this uh, article that you can see online lists all of his known works. One of the things that we have interest, an interesting relationship with the State Library because uh, in the past, works like this were not regarded as artistic. They were regarded as historical, of historical importance only with no artistic merit. We totally disagree with that. I think this yeah. is an absolutely beautiful work. Why do you think um, Henry painted this? Was, it, was this at a time when, is there any particular statement he could have been making at the time or was he of a school where he was 
out there going, I'm one of the few artists, I'm going to document this amazing city and would, I want the world to see what I see. He would certainly, certainly have been hoping that this would sell, but also there was a lithograph made of this. Uh, so what is a lithograph? Also, is that so some kind of print that's just available for newspaper and... No, and a lithograph, it's an, original, it's an original artwork, except that it can be produced in multiples. Uh, so that it's actually done by drawing onto a stone and printing from the stone, but it's the artist drawing directly onto the stone himself. Uh, so he painted this and he then copied it onto a stone and then you can, by having um, lithographs, you could sell them off. I don't know what they was, were selling for at the time, but they would have been much more affordable. You know, this would have been, for a moneyed person, a lithograph might be for, um, you, you wouldn't have needed at nearly as much money to buy a lithograph. And you could send it home, for example. You could send it back to wherever you'd come from, saying, look at this great city that I'm living in. Uh, why don't you come? Often it was about promoting uh, the city. Uh, you didn't want to show the, the dirt and the scum and the riffraff and the people throwing up outside Young and Jackson's. You, that's, that was to be avoided. You wanted to show um, it as a beautiful happening. and elegant city. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. But also, I don't, know, I don't know much more about Henry. I just kind of got on the net and had a little look about him. Mm. Do, after this, though, because this is a very European scene, so this is one of the kind of legacies of Australian art from Europeans. Mm. He's painted... Uh, men, man and woman in top hat, in horse and cart, people looking very tranquil, a few people who are working class mm. but very happy to be so, yes. this kind of thing. Mm. After this point, and I imagine at this point, there was a lot of struggle within all parts of society. Do you know, was there any point after this what Henry did? What, did he move on? Was there, did he well, paint in he, any other form? We know that he form? died here. Sorry, you asked before where he lived. We know he lived around Richmond and Collingwood. Um, which Very working class areas at the time, far more so than now, yes? Uh, I think a whole mix. Yeah. Um, that cert cert it certainly, uh, um, you know, a whole diverse range of people. In fact, um, just behind you, Jay, there's an image of, um, of Richmond at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, is that the time? Sorry, that's, yeah, 1866. And this is also a fabulous image to come and have a look at. So this is looking, again, looking north from the south side, looking across the Yarra, and the south side of the Yarra was very swampy, uh, which is why all the building took, took place on the north side. Uh, but for a long time, people grazed cows and so on there. But if you come and look closely, you can see that, that corner there, that little section is exactly the same scene that you're seeing here, but you can see uh, by this time what a f big flourishing city Melbourne had become by then. Yeah. Do you think there was a great pride in Melbourne at the time in conclusion? Mm. Do you think the, the residents and artists were very, very keen to show off Melbourne to the world? Um, I think the residents and artists, well certainly the artists were very keen to make a living. I think that's one of the key things. So they'd but paint anything? Not quite paint anything, paint, paint things that are saleable. And to be saleable, you want to show something that's elegant. One of the few artists who really did show the rough side of it is S.T. Gill, but he had very much a caricature approach. Uh, so he definitely did show the gold fields and, and the, the, yeah. the boxing fights on Sundays and the, um, the people coming back from the diggings, um, you know, the former servants who were driving through the streets with their showing off, basically, going through, swigging with the prostitutes beside them in the carriage because they could afford it. Um, but People like Henry Byrne, people like most of the artists you see in, in, in this part of our collection were not showing that. When people go into a gallery, finally, and they see early works of art, do you think they need to take into account that Australian history, through the eyes of painters, is romanticised early on? Is there, you know, because there's part of you that might go, there's a picture of a scene of the Sydney colony or in Melbourne, is it something that's you need to take with a grain of salt and go, well, this is not the complete reality. It's a romanticised reality. I think whenever we look at any art of any period, we need to be aware that we're looking at it through the artist's yep. eyes. I mean, an obvious artist for me to talk about when picking the theme of the, theme of the city is um, uh, John Brack's 5pm Collins Street. The grey people, you know, trudging up Collins Street on the way home after a hard day's work in the office. He's also coming at it absolutely... Um, uh, you know, through his own eyes about the yeah. drudgery of office life and what the city of Melbourne had become by then. I guess because I, uh, I always think you hear a date like 1861 and for, for perhaps an Indigenous Australian, this is yeah. a time when they're probably going through what they would class as some kind of frontier wars, you know, that like this is 
this is a serious time yeah. and we've got very, you know, not through any fault of someone like Henry, this is, yeah. the, there's, there's not much documentation of the time. So I feel like that conversation needs to be had where what else was going in the country yeah. at the time. But yet, yeah, I guess painters just were simply making a living and being, you know, painting tranquil scenes and going, this is my beautiful city, you know. Yeah, you're certainly wanting to document it. Yeah. Um, and, but yes, there's certainly an element of romanticisation. I mean, uh, Von Gerard is certainly known for his, what they call his house portraits. So particularly the, you know, people setting up houses uh, or um, pastoral estates, and then they would, uh, um, you know, somebody like Von Gerard would come along and say, would you like me to paint it? And then they had these beautiful, gorgeous scenes of these lush environments with very healthy looking uh, cattle who always stand side on. You can see the early paintings, Robert Dowling, who always got the cows to pose side on. Um, Von Gerard was a little bit looser than that. But uh, you're absolutely right that the um, uh, depiction of Aboriginal Australia at this time, particularly around the cities, is uh, very absent at this time. Uh, where Melbourne was founded was a very important meeting point, uh, different uh, community boundaries between the people who lived on the north, the hillside, people who lived on the south, the swamp side. Uh, there was a, a, a waterfall, uh, which is where the point at which the ships could, could um, pr proceed as far as they could up, up the Yarra. And that's the point at the bottom of Queen Street now. So where the aquarium is now, that was the turning circle. That was as far as the ships could sail up. Uh, and um, people could actually uh, walk across the waterfall, the rocks of the waterfall there, and that was the boundary. And so that's, it was an important point We're because that was fresh water. about the absence of Aboriginal culture in mm. the documentation. I mean, 150 years later, that might still be a point to make that uh, within the school curriculum, mm. there is still a complete absence of, or not complete, but you know what I mean, like an absence of that particular time as well. But I guess that comes back to as far as we're concerned, documentation yeah. happened in very small corners of the world, yeah. you know, just in paintings or yeah. certain types of writing. Well, it's actually interesting. If you look into Sydney's history at that time, you know, Sydney, obviously, we all know, founded in 1788. We all seem to know that date, even if we don't know the date our own city was founded. I should have said yesterday was Melbourne's birthday, 179 yesterday. Um, but happy birthday, <laughs> Melbourne. There were celebrations. I don't know if you know about them, but they don't seem to spread the word very far. But um, when, when people first settled in Sydney, there was a great fascination with the Indigenous community. And for a period, until, until expansion into land really took place, there's, there was actually quite a lot of dialogue. However, there was also, of course, um, you know, in, uh, diseases were introduced, total miscommunication. Um, it's actually going off on a slight tangent here, but Governor Phillip, who was the first governor of, uh, of New South Wales, he actually was missing his front tooth. And to the local people of the Sydney, the Aura people of the, of the Sydney area, that was a sign of an initiated man, which was just purely chance, but very interesting. In, and so there were quite a few portraits and studies of Aboriginal people at the time. You don't see this. You know, this is 70 years later. You don't see this in Melbourne. By then, Aboriginal people were not seen as a curiosity. They were seen as actually in the way which is terrible. But I do encourage you, there were walking tours um, around, along uh, Birrarung Ma, along the Yarra, uh, through the Botanic Gardens that are run by Indigenous um, communities, fascinating. Uh, and I do think we're a little bit more aware as we grow up, but I think certainly more in schools and, and uh, yeah. talks But encouraging conversation is what we're kind of about here today. I'm gonna have to cut it off. Today's painting, wonderful artist Henry Byrne, uh, a basic theme of the city today. I've asked Paul Dempsey, who's our musical guest, to come up with a general uh, theme of the city and if he had a song that might uh, kind of relate to his experiences within the city. I asked him just before and he said, well, every song he's going to play today is on that subject. So he's a very, he's a very good guest. Um, we're going to go in there now and in 10 minutes, Paul Dempsey's going to be on. If, you, if there's uh, any trouble getting in, it's only because of any extreme insurance issues with the NTV. I know it's very packed, so just go in and uh, there's speakers out here. Uh, the, the crowd can flood through. We'll see you in there.